Hey everyone, it's Anthony from NinerBravoAviation.com and today we're going to be talking about how to brief visual approaches. So the goal today is to outline all the requirements for visual approaches and then techniques for flying the visual approaches including the briefing. And I like to talk about this kind of stuff because it's not well covered while you're doing your instrument training. Most of your instrument training, as you know, is just do an ILS, do a GPS approach, do a mist approach, show me how to enter a hold and then land off of uh, an approach or just circling approach. You're not tested on visual approaches, but it's something you're going to run into a lot as you go through aviation. So, Question number one, what is a visual approach? As defined by the FAA, it is an approach conducted on an IFR flight plan and it authorizes a pilot to proceed visually and clear of clouds to the airport. Uh, in the aim here, this is 5-4-23 and that uh, is just a little bit that I just read out of uh, section A there. There are some other things that I'd like to cover in this uh, particular paragraph. For example, the uh, the fact that a visual approach is not an instrument approach procedure, but it is an instrument procedure. Uh, it's just done in visual meteorological conditions, and it says that there in that paragraph. So, once you get cleared for a visual approach by air traffic control, it doesn't mean that you are VFR now. It means that you are operating in visual conditions. You're still on an instrument flight plan. So, what do you need? Uh, for the controller to clear you for a visual approach. Well, it says here that the reported weather at the airport must have a ceiling at or above 1,000 foot ceilings and uh, visibility 3 miles or greater. And it's on air traffic control to actually know what that weather is so that they can clear you for a visual approach. If it's less than that, they have to clear you for an actual instrument approach procedure. Uh, let's see here. What else is good about this? So it goes on to say, you know, it's it's an IFR procedure conducted in vis uh, visual conditions. Uh, then it goes on to say that cloud clearance requirements of 14 CFR section 91 and 155 are not applicable. That is because this is an IFR procedure. You're just doing it in visual meteorological conditions. Now that being said, you do have to maintain clear of clouds. You're just not um, under under all the uh, the rules of Part 91 where it, it tells you need to be 1,000 above, 500 below, 2,000 away, you need 3 miles visibility. That's that's not it. You need 3 miles visibility at least or, uh, sorry, 3 miles visibility at least and to stay clear of clouds. So let's talk about uh, separation uh, for visual approach. This kind of goes more into um, what ATC needs for you to be uh, cleared for the, uh, to clear you for the approach and what kind of separation you have um, depending on your traffic and stuff like that. So in separation responsibilities, uh, when this is talking about when you are being cleared for a visual approach, the responsibilities between you and air traffic control. So if the pilot has the airport in sight but cannot see the aircraft to be followed, air traffic control may clear the aircraft for a visual approach. However, air traffic control retains both separation and wake vortex separation responsibility. If there's an aircraft in front of you, and for a lot, a lot of us flying around out there, that's not going to be the case. This is for flying into busier airports, uh, your Part 121 air carrier services. You'll be following airplanes. If you don't see that person in front of you, air traffic control is responsible for the separation of you and the wake vortex and the airplane. Uh, let's see, when visually following a preceding aircraft, acceptance of the visual approach clearance constitutes acceptance of pilot responsibility for maintaining a safe approach interval and adequate wake turbulence separation. What that part says is that if you call out that traffic in sight, it is completely on you to maintain separation from that airplane and uh, remain clear of the uh, the wake if, uh, if that's something that applies to you. Obviously a Cessna flying in another Cessna, yeah there'll be a little wake there but uh, probably not going to flip you end over end. Um, anyway, that uh, this next part I've always found very interesting. So what what happens if if you have to go or told to go missed approach on a visual approach? What's the game plan? Well E here tells us that there is not one and if you are flying at a controlled airport the control tower is going to issue you an instruction and if you're flying at an uncontrolled airport you are just supposed to stay clear of clouds and land as soon as possible 
So what it says here is a visual approach is not an instrument approach and therefore has no missed approach segment. If a go around is necessary for any reason, aircraft operating at controlled airports will be issued an appropriate advisory clearance or instruction by the tower. At uncontrolled airports, aircraft are expected to remain clear of clouds and complete a landing as soon as possible. If a landing cannot be accomplished, the aircraft is expected to maintain, uh, remain clear of clouds and contact air traffic control as soon as possible for further clearance so you can get back up into the clouds. Separation from other IFR aircraft will be maintained under these circumstances. So that's, that's a, an interesting one if you've ever thought, what am I going to do if I have to go missed off a of visual approach? It's right there, 5423E in the aim. Uh, it goes on in F to describe why visual approaches. Why do we have this as an option if the weather's good enough? It says, visual approaches reduce pilot controller workload and expedite traffic by shortening flight paths to the airport. It's the pilot's responsibility to advise ATC as soon as possible if a visual approach is not desired. That being the, the, um, where it says it's the pilot's responsibility to advise ATC if a visual approach is not desired, that is because this is kind of air traffic control's go-to. They would rather have you maintain separation because that takes the responsibility off of them and puts it on you uh, once you're cleared for this visual approach. And it also reduces the workload uh, as well. There's less radio chit-chat that, that goes into this whole thing. Uh, as well. And it can save you fuel too because being clear for a visual approach could allow you to maybe uh, cut corner turn base and uh, make that final approach just a little bit shorter, maybe a more direct route um, to the airport. And just once again to reiterate here, uh, G says that authorized to conduct a visual approach is an IFR authorization and does not alter the IFR flight plan, which means that if you land off a visual approach and you're not landing at a towered airport, you have to call flight service and cancel. That is still your responsibility. You still have to cancel the flight plan once you get on the ground. So that is, for the most part, everything you need to know about visual approaches, but still need to talk about how we're going to fly them. So what happens in a visual approach? Let's go over to, uh, to ForeFlight here, where we can kind of look. And we can see that I've got a, an instrument approach plate up here. This is the ILS runway 174 Tacoma Narrows. And why do I have that there? Well, because this is, for the most part, what a visual approach would look like to this particular airport. Um, because most of the time an ILS is, well, I mean, all the time an ILS is just an extension of the final approach course to that runway. And air traffic control likes to use this same template uh, to, uh, to line you up. They're going to line you up with the runway, and if you need to, um, say, you know, land on a different runway, that's probably going to be at the discretion of the uh, the tower um, or something like that. But they'll clear you for a visual approach to a specific runway. Um, so that visual approach could be a straight in. It could be for a, uh, a downwind if you wanted to land on the other side of that little strip of pavement there. But um, that is uh, essentially how it goes. They clear you for the approach, and you fly something that looks a lot like this. Which begs the question, why don't we use the localizer as a backup to help us guide ourselves to the runway. And that is exactly what every air carrier does and what you should also do. If there is a nav aid that allows you to track some sort of lateral or vertical guidance to the runway, why are you not using it? I mean, it's just so perfect to have it there. Uh, of course, it's great to practice uh, being on the path, but you can do that and then check your work with the glide slope. I mean, that's, that's also kind of cool. So anyway, because we can use a nav aid like this, we can also now brief a visual approach using the instrument approach plate associated with that nav aid. So for example, this ILS here for runway 17, if I was to go through and brief this, I would brief it similar to how I would brief the actual approach, except for I don't have minimums in this case. I, uh, I don't have to worry about the uh, glide slope intercept, although it's nice to know the distance and what altitude that would be at if I was uh, intercepting it on 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 this approach. It gives you a good place to start altitude wise so you don't end up being high because you know ATC could clear you for a visual and you'd be like a million feet high. So um, I want to talk about a couple of other reasons why you might want to back up your visual approaches with an instrument nav aid um, before we talk about briefing it. And the example that I want to use, not not just to uh, you know make sure that you know first operationally, because you can follow a localizer with the autopilot and make it just 
super easy, but it also gives you a path to the correct piece of payment uh, that you're going to land on. And my example for this is El Paso. Uh, right here you can see El Paso International Airport. And right here, this is runway 22 if you are landing uh, to the south there. And just to the northwest of or basically it's just straight up north of this, is Biggs Army Airfield. Also, with a runway that is very, very similar, this is runway 21 at Biggs and then 22 here at El Paso, and they're less than two miles apart. So, when you are cleared for visual somewhere out here, and you turn your final, you're going to see two runways there, and it's going to be kind of hard to distinguish these two airports, because of the way that they're laid out. You've got similar runways. The apron at Biggs looks like uh, sort of could be mistaken for this other runway here at El Paso. So we should uh, make it a practice to back up, in, especially in this particular case, our approach, our, our visual approach with a nav aid. So you could do the three finger swipe to get to the El Paso approach. Uh, you could use the ILS 2.2 as a backup for your visual approach into El Paso to make sure that you don't land at Biggs Air Force Base which is literally right next to the airport and those runways are incredibly close to each other in both uh, the way that they're laid out and, uh, and the distance there. So what's another reason why you might want to back up your visual approach with a instrument approach procedure? Well how about terrain? Uh, especially at night. So this is the RNAV GPS runway 2 approach to Boundary County and uh, let's say it's nighttime, the visibility is you know five miles or something like that and um, you know it's clear just five miles of visibility, a little bit of haze and stuff like that and it's nighttime out and the winds are favoring runway 2. Look at all this terrain that's around here and you guys can't see it but up there where that little uh, obstacle is 2583 feet there are some hills behind there uh, and it's uh, a I wouldn't I want to say it's a tight fit, but it's tight enough, especially if you're uh, in, you know, if, if you're in limited visibility, it could be kind of nasty. So this is a great, great opportunity for you to back up this uh, visual approach with an RNAV approach course, because these are designed to keep you clear of terrain. Um, this is a great, great thing to do. In fact, in the, in the air carrier world, if you're doing a visual approach at night, it needs to be backed up with an approach that has lateral, uh, at the very least, guidance, and I'm sure that a lot of other carriers also require uh, vertical guidance on their approach as well. And that is required for 121 in some airlines at night. So why not operate under the same kind of, uh, kind of rule there? So let's talk about how we brief visual approaches now. Now we've uh, We've looked at a few of them, so let's pop back over to uh, the ILS at Tacoma Narrows and talk about how we brief this. Now, I'm sure most of you wouldn't be surprised to know that this is very similar to how you would brief a normal approach uh, like an ILS. It's just you don't have to brief things like the missed approach because, as we talked about, if it's a towered airport, they're going to give you instructions. So that missed approach does not apply. Now, that being said, if everything went to hell in a handbasket, sure you got a missed approach there. You've also got the MSA right there. So these are just a couple more reasons why you should at least have the approach plate up so you can see everything uh, that you might want to know as far as minimum safe altitudes go and um, what if you did have to do a missed approach and you went lost comms or something like that. What would you do then? So anyways, here's how you brief a visual approach. You're gonna start with the type of approach. This is the ILS, runway 17 for Tacoma Narrows. And we want to make sure it's current, so we'll check the date. It's valid 18th of July 2019 to 15th of August 2019. So, what else do we want to know? We probably want to know all the stuff that's up here in the, uh, everything applicable anyways, in the briefing strip here. So we know the localizer frequency that we're going to be following. That's going to be 109.1. You check down here to see what the uh, Morse code identifier is if you don't have one of those fancy glass cockpits that identifies it for you. Tune it, set it to an approach course of 167. And a little bit about the runway you're going to land on, it's 5,002 feet. The touchdown zone is 294 and the airport's at 295 feet. These uh, 
little tidbits here are not applicable, the missed approach and these little notes here, because it's a visual approach. Those limitations don't, um, don't apply there. Uh, it would be nice to know, however, if the visibility was as low as you could get it to three miles, what kind of approach light system you have. So I might brief that you have a Mauser approach light system um, because that's up there. It tells you what to look for, what kind of lights you can use as guidance if the visibility if the visibility is kind of starting to get down there. What else would be good? Oh yeah, frequencies for the tower because most of the time approach control is going to hand you off or center is going to hand you off and say switch to advisory, which is going to be listed there as well. And, or contact tower, they're not going to tell you the frequency. So the frequency is right there, and if you do need to go missed, it's nice to have 120.1 because tower is not going to hand you back off with the frequency, and um, when you're switching from advisory at an uncontrolled airport, there's nobody there to tell you what that frequency is. So um, have those there, another reason to have the uh, approach backed up, uh, or the approach played up. What else would you like to know? Where's the PAPI at? Where's the uh, visual vertical guidance? And it's going to be on the right side of runway 17. Another just great thing to know. And if you're feeling, feeling interested in it, talk about where the glide slope intercept would be normally. So 2,000 feet, uh, 5 miles from the runway is where you should intercept the glide slope. The rest of this is applicable to the ILS. That's fine. And it's, it's totally okay as well to brief a visual with, with the normal procedure that you would use to brief a, uh, an instrument approach procedure in the first place. You could brief this like an ILS because you can fly a visual approach exactly like an ILS. So in practice, this is what it's going to sound like. This is the ILS for runway 17 Tacoma Narrows Airport, uh, 18th of July 2019 to 15th August 2019. The localizer is 109.1 with the final approach course of 167 degrees. The runway landing is 5,002 feet. Touchdown zone elevation is 294. Airport is at 295 feet. Expect a Mauser approach light system with a PAPI on the right side. And I'm going to plan to intercept the glide slope at 2,000 feet, 5 miles from the runway. That is how you brief a visual approach procedure. Before we end, let's talk about one very intriguing type of visual approach procedure, and that's called the charted visual approach procedure, or charted visual flight procedure. If we go to the AIM, we could read a little bit about this. It's exactly what it sounds like. It says, charted visual flight procedures are charted visual approaches established for environmental noise consideration and or when necessary for the safety and efficiency of air traffic operations. The approach charts depict prominent landmarks courses, and recommended altitudes to specific runways. Charted visual flight procedures are designed to be, prim to be used primarily for turbojet aircraft. So in a Cessna, this is probably not going to happen unless you are flying corporate, which could be a possibility. Who knows? Um, so we'll just briefly, briefly touch on this and go over. Uh, you can read the rest of this in the AIM if you'd like, but let's go look at one. Go over here. And we'll pull up what's called the tiptoe visual in San Francisco. And this is what a charted visual approach procedure, uh, flight procedure, looks like. It is essentially just a, a, a plan view, uh, top down, as it were, view of what the approach is going to look like. And this is going to most of the time use nav aids. Uh, for example, the tiptoe visual actually uses RNAV waypoints like Eddie and Sidby and Shara. And it also uses the localizer for runway 28 left. It'll give you the frequency right there. So how would I go about briefing this? Like an instrument approach procedure in general. Because they will clear you specifically for this type of visual. So they say cleared for the tiptoe visual runway 28 left. Easy enough, right? So you're clear for the tiptoe visual 28 left. Here's your briefing. So this is the tiptoe visual runway 28 left. San Francisco International for San Francisco, California. The date on the charts, 18th July 2019 to 15th of August 2019. So it looks like we can start this approach from Eddie uh, at or above 6,000, and then we go to Sidby at or above 5,000, then we go to Chera with no altitude restriction, and then on a 310 heading to intercept the 284. Uh, degree 
localizer course inbound to 28 left. Um, for the weather minimums, what we need here is uh, for San Francisco, we need it to report 2,500 feet and 5 miles visibility, or we San, San Francisco could report 1,000 foot ceilings with 3 miles visibility with 5 miles visibility reported in the eastern quadrant, uh, which is uh, 030 to 120 degrees. And the San Mateo AWOS needs to report 2,405. Uh, if the AWOS is inoperative, you can use the SQL airport. I looked that up earlier. I don't remember the name. It's 2,400 feet and 5 miles visibility. That's what you need to do that. Here's an interesting bit. Also brief the missed approach on the chart of visual ones. They don't always have one, but this one does. Um, Tiptoe visual approach to a left, closely spaced parallel. Visual approaches may be in progress. In the event of a go-around on 28 left, turn left heading 265 and on runway 28 right heading of 280. Climb maintain 3000 or as directed. Bam. That's how you brief a chart of visual approach procedure. It's interesting that this one has a, um, an actual missed approach procedure in the note there. I thought that was interesting at the very least. So other things you can note about the visual approach procedures here, look at these things here. They got the cement plant out there, the San Mateo Bridge, the Dumbarton Bridges. Why are those important? Because air traffic control is going to reference those because they know what visual approach you're going to be cleared for and they know what landmarks it uses. Uh, notice that you intercept the, uh, the localizer right around the, uh, the cement plant right there. And the Dumbarton Bridges is right off of your right wing at Shara. Uh, and the San Mateo Bridge as well, once you're established on the, uh, the localizer, you should be flying over that. And um, that's, that's pretty much it for that one. Uh, other cool things here with the weather minimums, notice that in the first case here, San Francisco needs to be 2,500 feet or 5 miles visibility unless uh, you've got other weather reports to say the visibility in the east is better. Um, so the reason why that is, is because San Francisco, it's the way that they run their airport. Every one of these approaches is designed for the way that they run their airport. So they bring in traffic from out here in the, uh, in the east side as well. And there's a whole other visual approach that is designed for the, other, uh, for the other runway in that particular case. So why would they want more visibility in the eastern quadrant? Because they want to pass off the separation of traffic to you. If you say that you've got the other guy in sight, especially considering that you have to, uh, to do parallel approaches in this case, then the responsibility is not on them anymore to keep you separated. At least it, it needs to be on you in this case because those two runways are so close together. Uh, otherwise, they're going to have to stagger you guys on those localizers and they need more ceiling and more visibility to do that. So it's important in this case for the eastern visibility to be, uh, to be decent uh, and the western on the west side near the coast is it doesn't have to be as good because that's not where all the traffic is coming in from. Anyway, now that I've blabbed about chart of visual flight procedures more than uh, everything else in this video, uh, hopefully this helps explain some of the visual approaches. You're going to do a lot of them while you're out there uh, flying around in the real world. Um, make sure you throw in an ILS every once in a while. A GPS approach would be good too. And uh, don't be afraid to back up your visual approaches with an actual instrument procedure. Take care.